Hi, welcome to Actual Lol. I'm John Perkis. Today I'm doing a Q&A where I'm answering the questions that you've sent me on Patreon or on the YouTube community tab. I'm currently running a pledge drive to try and support the future of Actual Lol. I can't continue to afford to make videos long term and eventually I'm going to have to stop. So if you like the videos, if Actual Lol is one of your favorite YouTube channels, then please consider pledging at patreon.com forward slash Actual Lol. Any amount really, really will help and we're a third of the way to the goal, so we really could reach this and secure the future for actual lol. Daniel Durkin asked, what game do you enjoy that is otherwise unsung or not widely known slash played? A game that's from a long time ago that I think is really cool and is just kind of completely died off is uh, Show Manager from Queen Games. You're putting on musicals and you're just trying to hire actors and you've got to cast different people for like the different musicals so it's kind of like a set collection thing and it's got this really awesome like hand management rule where you can only cast so many actors before you have to kind of put on the play and so you can push your luck to try and go for one of the bigger musicals it's a real gateway game and i think it's got a really cool theme to it but it's it's got horrific artwork and it's kind of old and i guess it just didn't quite click enough with like the big names in the YouTube world and maybe it came out at slightly the wrong time but I think with the right reprint from with some nicer artwork I think it's a really cool game and it's one that's really stuck around in my collection despite every time thinking like yeah I should probably get rid of this and then I play it and I'm like no I really like this game uh, so yeah show manager. David Christians asks what is your favorite video that you've made? The ones that stand out especially from like a long time ago um, the hidden movement games video. I remember putting so much work and love into that one and really being happy with the jokes in it. I think really the ones that I especially love are going to be the ones that I really feel like they're the funniest or like I like the characters in them or I just like the jokes that I've written. And so that was one that I was really proud of that I remember at the time sort of didn't do as well as I'd hoped but I think that was just because it was kind of a niche subject matter. Um, but then since I've kind of still occasionally get comments on it and it's, it's just one that I kind of look back at with fondness and one that I can rewatch and not kind of cringe at. Jonathan DeWett asks, how did you and your wife meet if it's not too personal? Uh, it's not really personal too much. Um, we met at university. I was already there. I had a friend who was starting university in that first year, a friend called Tom, and he moved into halls and Serena just happened to live with him. So I went around there to meet his flatmates and I met her. And it wasn't until kind of six months later that we actually kind of kissed for the first time and then our you know relationship started but that's how we met so we we're just really lucky to have kind of been connected by our friends and um and yeah that six months went past before anything like happened so you know i sort of feel like it might have never happened and obviously i'm so glad that it did because i didn't really know the kind of person she was until i actually kind of got to know her properly that was 15 years ago, um, sort of last month, because it was Freshers' Week of 2004. So yeah, a long time ago. Andrew Little asks, board game theme you'd love to see done well or done more? Definitely medical themes. I, I'm really, I just really connect with that kind of thing. I love real world stuff. I love I know for some people they want to escape and go to a fantasy world or a sci-fi world and I want something that I can connect to that feels real and for me like fun escapism is trying to take on the role of something else, another job or life that you can have in like the world that we know and there's just always been something about kind of doctors and hospitals and I really love the TV show ER, that's one of my favourite uh, things and I love all of that kind of science. I never had any intention to do it. It's not like a thing that I wish that I'd done, um, but I just, I'm fascinated by it. And so I, I feel like there's real potential for games like that to exist. I always kind of wished that there was a Sherlock Holmes consulting detective game, but sort of with a house type theme uh, where you're trying to like di diagnose a patient, um, something like that would be great. Running a hospital, you know, a bit like theme hospital, anything that's kind of got a real deep thematic connection. You know, there are games out there like it and I'm not gonna kind of slag them off for any particular one thing, but none of them have 
quite done what I may be like hoping for. So that's definitely something I'd love to see. Max asks, what is your top exception to the rule game? I.e. one that falls into a category you don't usually like, but for some reason just clicks. That's a good question. I think there's probably a few like dotted around my collection. The one that I'm thinking of is Brewcrafters because it's kind of a medium Euro game. It's worker placement. Doesn't have a whole lot of player interaction, which is something I tend to look for in a game. But I like it because of the theme, because it does a, a really nice job of kind of representing the simple workings of like running a, a beer company. And that's just a nice theme for me that I can kind of just buy into for that, that session. It's not a game that I would play loads, um, but I, I kind of, you know, I can enjoy um, the puzzle and the challenge of Euro games, but really I play games for the social interaction. And so I tend not to, even though I might occasionally enjoy aspects of certain games, I'm not gonna go back to them as often because I don't get to interact with the players and that's why I'm playing the board game. But Brewcrafters is one where I just enjoy the kind of little story that it tells um, enough that I, I would go back to it. Azar Khan asks, which board games have the best narrative or emergent storytelling? Well, for me, I really like this war of mine as having really, a, it has a really well-written storytelling book that just sort of amazingly manages to tackle such a heavy subject matter in such a well-written way. Like I've played so many different storytelling games. I have such high hopes for them, but I also have kind of high expectations. And so therefore I'm quite critical of them. And on top of it just being good writing for a board game, it's good writing for like a heavy subject matter, at least every, every extract that we've had has kind of really made you feel it. Um, and that is super hard to pull off in anything, like in a book or a film or whatever. Whereas, you know, other board games are just having to hit a bar of don't be cheesy. And, you know, so many times it, it does feel like that. And then finally, you've got Detective, Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective and Chronicles of Crime. I love all of those games in sort of slightly different levels. I think they all do a good job of kind of capture, capturing you into a story. The writing might not always be exactly what I would want, like in Detective or Chronicles, it, it feels a bit hackneyed, but in terms of the story it's telling, I think that they're really well crafted and that's ultimately like, that makes the game experience. Johnny Dale asks, what's your gaming schedule like? When do you play? Who do you play with? Well, it varies, but generally I, I would play kind of one or two weekday evenings uh, with kind of a group. So I might invite people over to my flat or um, go to London on board, which is like the big meetup in London that's in uh, various pubs in the center. Well, I don't have like a set evening. I, I'm maybe just not that organized. Um, and you know, I, if I can fit it in, then I'll play like a two player game with my wife. And then on the weekends, again, on a good week, I would probably go to London on board um, for like a good, I don't know, five or six hours on Saturday or Sunday. And then hopefully on the other day, like play one or two games with my wife. So yeah, it, that that's, that's probably an average week. But then sometimes if it's really on, like just before I was doing the Essen thing, I was really scheduling. I was maybe playing like four or five times in a week because there was just so many games that I needed to get played. And um, it, it gets a bit more uh, kind of rigorous. Zara House asks, is there a way we viewers can help you grow your channel besides Patreon? Because I have my own dream job I'm going after, becoming a children's book author. That's a cool uh, dream. So I don't make much money myself, but I do really like your content and would like to support that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There are loads of different ways that people can help. It really, really helps if people share my videos on social media. Like you can't imagine how hard it is to grow something, especially when you're always fighting against the YouTube algorithm. Like YouTube wants good videos all the time and I'm not able to do that. To be able to stand out as a board game maker, I have to make really quality videos because there are so many other people making videos that are bigger than me and have bigger teams and whatever and I can't compete with their regularity. So I have to stand out in terms of quality and I hope, you know, I like to think that I do that, but to do that, it means I have to spend weeks and weeks on one specific video. And YouTube doesn't like that. You know, they want you to be releasing regularly. And if you don't release regularly, then the next time you make a video, 
they'll, they'll show it to less people and not just to less other people, to less of your own subscribers. There are things that really, really, really help. So l pressing like on YouTube, uh, on the videos, every video, if you could do that, that would be amazing. Um, subscribing to the channel, of course, but also put ticking that bell because if, uh, if you tick the bell, you get notified of the video, which means that you're definitely going to hear about the video. And then if you watch the video early, like as soon as you're notified or, you know, within a day or whatever, YouTube notices that. They think that the video is doing well so that then they send it out to more people and I start to get seen by, you know, other audiences. So, uh, but then, it, you know, it's the same on all other social media. So if you don't already, please follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Board Game Geek. I have a blog on there where I post all my videos. And when I post on those things, again, if you like on Facebook, Twitter, um, if you retweet or share on Facebook, if you like on Instagram, and if you like on BGG, you know, especially BGG, I get a lot of new viewers from there. And you can't imagine how useful it is for my video to be pushed to new people. I'm always still, you know, I can't believe that I've been going for four and a half years and there are still people on Board Game Geek within that community that have never seen my video until eventually they have and they catch one. And, um, and, and that's huge for me because it, it grows the audience and then uh, it means ultimately that if I can go from where I am now, 23,000 subscri uh, 23, subscribers, and let's say double it, then that's just a whole bigger pool of people that might be willing to support me on Patreon. So even if you can't, you're opening me up to a, a whole bunch of people that might be able to. Ashath Mohammed asked, if you were to say, change the rules for Monopoly to make it better, what rules would you make? What rules would you change what rules would you keep and why? I've had to think about this one. This is a tough question because I think there's sort of so much wrong with Monopoly that's at the core of it, like the roll and move and the going around the board, that it's so hard to kind of fix that and still retain anything about Monopoly. What would I keep? Well, I guess I would keep the trading of your properties, that kind of negotiation aspect. But again, like what one of the things that's at the core of it is you know, the fact that you land on someone else's and you have to pay them. I hate that. And that is purely kind of luck driven. And I don't see how you can kind of fix that and it still be Monopoly. Um, I was kind of imagining uh, I would like a more kind of realistic street layout, I suppose. I think something that has more of a spatial thing, but then you're moving into games that do exist like Chinatown and Lords of Vegas that are both really interesting games that have negotiation and I think just kind of completely replace Monopoly. I think there's probably a game that you could make that would still have that same heart to it, um, but you've got to tear out everything that makes Monopoly what it is. And really that roll and move and yeah, the, the landing on people's thing, I don't see how you improve that, but I'd love to hear if anyone's got any, um, any thoughts. HM asks, what are your top five group board games that are easy to explain to a large group that can't pay attention to a long list of rules? We play a lot of code names and I tried to introduce Decrypto, which went well with small groups, but not larger groups since people want something without fiddly rules. Yeah, I totally get that. I, I think that Decrypto is a great game, but it just has like one too many things that if you're trying to play with a lot of people that are all having conversations with each other or they're drunk or distracted, that it just kind of, it, it's just like a little bit, too much like hard work. I think that Telestrations is great for this or Scrawl. Um, very, very simple and just great with big groups. You know, you can get the party pack that goes to 12 players. Uh, there's a game called Hive Mind, which I talk about in my top 10 couch games, uh, which is just so simple. You just have to like all write down something in a category and then see if you match. Uh, there's another game, Sixes, which is a smaller box, probably kind of hard to get. It's kind of similar to Hive Mind. Um, then um, I would say ooh, just one is great, I think, for a big group. Because you're playing cooperatively, I think it's just easier for everyone to kind of explain the rules to each other. Plus, it is just really simple on rules. Adam Winton asks, if you could choose a game to become a legacy game, which would you choose and why? What features would you want included? Uh, I think the cheat answer to that is that I kind of don't need that many more legacy games. Legacy games scare me because they're this huge investment and you want to always play it with the same group. And so I've got a copy of Risk Legacy up there. I've also got King's Dilemma and they are sitting there waiting for that specific group to come back together and it's just hard to make it happen. So I'm not that thrilled by the idea of legacy games just from a kind of practical point of view. But if I, if I imagine that I had unlimited time and that all my friends were available, 
um, then I think something like Western Legends or Merchants and Marauders, uh, two sandbox games, so I don't even know how you'd pull it off as a legacy game. Um, lots going on, you get to choose your path, and it would be just be cool if then the board was impacted or you could make a change, you know, so if you're a pirate and then you start to build this legacy that changes over the course of your entire lifetime, that's, that's really cool to me. Ben Broomfield asks, when your patron gets to a good level to expand, what do you think is next for actual lol? Uh, well, this was actually asked before the pledge drive, but I mean, obviously first, it, it's just about trying to secure a future, but I, there are so many things that I'm really excited to get to. Um, and one of those is I'm gonna start trying to do a kind of let's play playthrough thing. And I'm, I'm gonna try and add some elements to that that you know I haven't finalized yet or anything, so I don't wanna say too much, but I'm trying something different um, that I feel like could be really cool if I can pull it off, if I can get the chemistry right. Um, I wanna make it really entertaining. So obviously it's gonna be kind of really edited, um, snappy and and not boring. I, it needs to be something that I would watch. I don't tend to watch Let's Plays that much, so I want it to be something that would be interesting to anyone. I would like to make more content that talks about board games as kind of a more general thing. One of the things that I really liked about um, my Monopoly video was just kind of talking to a wider audience. And you know, it did reach a wider audience on things like Facebook, where you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're talking to non-gamers and you're saying, this is why board games are good. And then more comedy stuff, you know, there's so many different characters I'd love to do. And um, just, I would love to be able to put jokes in more things. For me, like, I, I would love every video to be as entertaining as some of my best ones. Um, and that just all takes time. And if I could, if the Patreon would grow to a level where I could work with other people, uh, maybe to kind of edit the videos, things like that, then I could focus on um, just making them funnier and making them better. Old Slimy asks, Hi John, how have board games enriched your personal relationships such as your marriage? My wife and I have so many board game inspired inside jokes these days. I think that they give me a chance, yeah, to just play, to spend time with my wife that isn't um, watching TV. Uh, it, it gives us something where we're interacting with each other and talking and sparking conversation um, and uh, yeah, I really, I just really appreciate it for that. that. That's not to say that we wouldn't necessarily do other things, but it creates this quality time that we have together that you can just do at home, indoors, when you're feeling tired. Um, it fits into gaps easily, you know, it doesn't require you to kind of go out on some big date night or whatever. It's really flexible like that, and I really appreciate it for that. I think it's really helped me transition from um, being a young person that, just kind of all the social activity revolved around going out and drinking to having this new thing where I can see my friends and have a reason to see them. Me and my three oldest friends that I've known since I was like eight years old, um, we played code names together on a WhatsApp. And you know, we're, we're in kind of four different parts of the world. Two of them are in other European countries. We didn't get to see each other, but we were playing this game like whilst we're all just doing different things and it was just awesome for that. It helped us kind of remember each other and be in touch with each other um, at a time when we weren't able to do that in person because it cost a lot of money to fly and see each other and because we have busy lives. Uh, Dowers2001 asks, what is your top five or 10 board games? I'm gonna cheat here, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you, uh, but I am planning to make a video very soon as part of this big pledge drive where I talk about my top 50 board games. Uh, and so please just look out for that. Dtramer1 asks, have you played the cooperative mobile game Space Team? It isn't a board game, but it checks every box for me that board games do. You have to be in the same room with other people and interact with them. Yeah, I have played that and it's great fun. If people don't know what it is, it's basically like a mobile app where you all install it on your phones uh, and then you like have to connect them up. And then it's kind of like a real time cooperative game where you're having to shout instructions to people. So. I say something nonsense like you have to close down the flaps and then they have a but someone else has a button on their screen that they can then press so it it demands collaboration because I will never have instructions that come up that are just for me you know it's it's about like getting people to listen to what I need to do and there's like timers that are ticking down and you can like lose lives and if it kind of all goes wrong and bits of the ship fall off it 
it, it has a nice kind of like little bit of a theme to it and it's fun and chaotic. Like you wouldn't want to play it loads. It's really an intense experience, but it's great. And another game that I would recommend in that vein, because I kind of went through a phase with some of my gaming friends of playing this kind of stuff is Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, something like that. It's a video game ostensibly, but one person is in control of like a bomb that they're trying to defuse. And then everyone else is trying to help them defuse it. So they can't see anything else and they are having to describe the bomb that they can see, the other players can't see the bomb, um, and tell them what modules it has. Like, the, And it has all these different wires they have to cut or numbers that they have to press in a certain order. And then the other players have all this documentation literally like printed out of what they, how these different puzzles work. And so then they have to then get information from the bomb person. It's like, well, what color is the wire? And they say red. Oh, but is it, you know, is there two of them or three of them? And they say that. And so then they can then deduce down what why they then have to cut and give that information back. So you're doing it all against the timer before the bomb explodes. And it's just great. And you can keep adding levels and it adds all these extra different modules. It's it's an experience game that I really feel like everyone should try. You can get it on Steam and maybe even on a tablet, but you just play it on a laptop or on a computer and everyone else is just kind of sat there with bits of paper that you've printed out. It's so much fun. It doesn't necessarily hold up. You wouldn't maybe play it like a hundred times, um, but those first few times you do it is electric and it feels like playing an escape room. Dtramer1 asks, do you like musicals? If so, do you have a favorite? I do a little bit. I've kind of grown into them. I never used to watch them as a kid. And I don't know how many I've actually even watched. I think a lot of them just didn't appeal. But recently I watched uh, Hamilton the musical and I was really skeptical about it, even though everyone like raves about it. And um, my, my wife basically wanted to go for her birthday. And so I went along and it was amazing. It was just like the storytelling of it was great. And the, I just loved the lyricism of it, the kind of multisyllabic rhyming schemes. Um, of some of the the raps are just incredible and like the songs are so catchy and then I was listening it to it forever Afterwards to the point I got really addicted to it, but then I find it quite like emotionally um, Sort of hard work because like it's it's a sad uh, Play and so I would listen to those songs because I like the songs But then it sort of reminds you of the story and I found that quite sort of intense So I don't listen to it so much anymore. I don't know if I've ever seen any others live which I probably should because London has loads. I just don't think I would like the kind of obvious ones. Um, and then in terms of films, I've watched uh, The Greatest Showman, which I really liked the songs for, but felt like the, the story slash film was just a bit like, uh, it just didn't really grab me, but um, I still listen to the soundtrack of that. It's just like really uplifting. Um, I listen a lot to some of the songs from Waitress the musical, but I haven't actually seen the musical yet. I just kind of came across it through Spotify and I got really hooked on the Sarah Bareilles, like uh, her album where she performs them rather than the actual musical cast. And aside from that, oh, um, I've watched this uh, Scottish one, uh, which is based around the music of the Proclaimers called Sunshine on Leaf, which is great because it's like set in Edinburgh and it's like a little bit cheesy, but the songs are good because like they're Proclaimers songs. And um, yeah, my, my wife really enjoyed that one. And I thought it was like good. It's like a sort of seven out of 10 or something. So um, I'd recommend that. I think it was on Netflix. Dawas2001 asks, which games are you excited about in Spiel 2019 or in the future? I mean, I'm asking this after the convention now. Hopefully you saw my most anticipated games uh, video and I'll be talking about the games that I've sort of my Essen Hall uh, soon. So I'll talk about some ones that are coming out beyond Essen um, and in the future. There's a party game called Wavelength, which is from uh, the people that made Monikers and Wolfgang Warsh, who designed The Mind. And it's just a really cool sounding party game where you're trying to guess uh, where something is on a wavelength and you are giving clues. So it's another kind of very simple, cool party game idea that I think is gonna really work. And um, it's got an amazing box cover as well. Uh, Thrive is an abstract game that sounds really cool that has, it's kind of set in like a pond and you um, represent like these flowers that are evolving. And basically you have like a wooden piece that has pegs in it. 
and the pegs determine how your piece can move and your pieces evolve. So throughout the game, you'll add pegs that mean it can now move in different directions. So it's playing on ideas that you have in Onitama or um, uh, the uh, Duke about how your pieces move, but it's changing over the course of the game. That sounds really cool. And I love simple, but you know, engrossing abstract strategy games. So that's Thrive. Um, I'm really excited about the anti-up expansion for Western Legends because Western Legends is a sandbox game from last year about being a Wild West person that was one of my favorite games and the things that they're adding to it just make it sound even cooler like there's a train that goes around the outside of the board and you can rob the train that just sounds great that's it I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question but I'm sure I will in a future video remember if you want to support the future of actual old please pledge at patreon.com forward slash actual there's a link below I'm John Perkis thanks for watching